This episode is brought to you by Odd Mo's Pizza in Canby. Handmade awesome pizza plus craft beer, cider, and wine delivered. Call them today at 503-266-8444. This episode is also brought to you by the Canby Liquor Store, your friendly hometown source for wine, beer, and spirits since 1972. Find them under new ownership and in their new location at the Canby Market Center near Fred Meyer. Welcome to the Canby Now Podcast. Your source for news. The threat of a possible teacher strike was avoided this week. There's a new irresistibly cute creature winning over fans. And its name is Scootaloo. Sports? It's like Lucy in the football. You want to kick a field goal, but they take it away from you. We had to learn how to win. Mm -hmm. Goal can't be in the last second of the game! And interesting conversations. Because I'm one of the strongest girls ever, and I know that for a fact. I just really enjoy writing gossip as if I was a bear. <laughs> With an old maid daughter that make the best moonshine in the coast. <laughs> if it would have hit me in the face, I think I would have died. I really do. It, it, it... I guarantee you would have died, man. Are you kidding me? <laughs> The Canby City Council has moved to place new city administrator Scott McClure on paid administrative leave effective immediately, following an emergency meeting and executive session that was held Thursday night at City Hall. The council had noticed the executive session under a provision of Oregon law that allows closed doors meetings to quote, consult with council concerning the legal rights and duties of a public body with regard to current litigation or litigation likely to be filed. The move to place McClure on leave was announced in an email Friday morning from Assistant City Administrator Amanda Zyber. She said, quote, the nature of executive session is that any discussion is confidential. The only information available at this time is the action taken by the City Council in an open meeting following the executive session. A follow-up executive session has been scheduled for this week following the Council's regularly scheduled meeting on Wednesday. The provision of Oregon law cited is to consider the dismissal or disciplining of or to hear complaints or charges brought against a public officer, employee, staff member or individual agent. Zyber's email concluded with a note that it's important not to speculate or otherwise rumor about why City Council took action, which of course basically guaranteed endless speculation from local City Hall watchers all weekend as to why City Council took action. But that remains a mystery. Elected officials are declining comment on the matter and have directed all inquiries to City Attorney Joe Lindsay, who is present at the executive session. In an email, Lindsay also declined to comment further, saying he must keep the confidences of his client, the City Council, regarding executive session. I know this might not satiate the public at this time, Lindsay said, but it is necessary to preserve all rights to all parties involved. McClure was hired this summer following a months-long recruiting process and stepped into his new role October 7. He was previously the longtime administrator of the City of Monmouth near Salem. He replaced Rick Robinson, who retired in October after serving as Canby's top administrator since 2014. On Tuesday night, the community got its first real look at an approximately 75 million bond proposal the Canby School Board is considering placing on the ballot for the May primary. The bond is designed to extend, but not raise, tax rates by replacing the current bond payments that built Baker Prairie Middle School 15 years ago. It has long been known that the proposal would be aimed at improving school facilities and addressing deferred maintenance projects, as well as expanding opportunities for hands-on learning and upgrading school safety and security. But at the community meeting held in the Library of Ackerman Center this week, the district presented some of the specifics. Under the draft package presented Tuesday of the estimated $75 million, a replacement bond measure would raise $27.2 million would go towards high-priority facility upgrades and safety improvements, including addressing roof repairs and replacements, HVAC systems, and other interior and exterior projects. 
$22.75 million would go towards replacing the existing 200 wing science classrooms and lab spaces at Canby High School, including design, demolition, and new construction. $10.2 million would go towards instructional technology improvements in classrooms, gyms, cafeterias, libraries, and computer labs, and new individual devices for students. $4 million would go towards upgrades of existing light fixtures to more efficient and long-lasting LED fixtures and controls. $2.8 million would go towards district-wide ADA improvements, including new restrooms at each school. $650,000 would go towards a robust master planning process for the future of the district's facilities. $90,700 would go towards fire safety improvements at Knight and Lee Elementary. And $7.5 million, or 10%, would be retained for contingency and management of the funds and projects. On Tuesday, the district presented several alternatives for different athletic improvement projects that could be done. Then, they gave attendees the chance to vote on their favorites with novelty Cougar Bucks. These included new turf infields for Canby High School softball and baseball, a new multi-purpose turf athletic field at CHS, drainage improvements to the ex existing athletic fields at Baker Prairie, and resurfacing the existing track at the Ackerman Center. Canby is currently in the midst of district-wide polling to further gather feedback and input from prospective voters about the projects included in the bond package and the proposed ballot language. The final meeting of the Bond Development Committee will be this Tuesday, February 18, at which the group would review the poll results and input from the community meeting and make changes or adjustments as necessary. The package will then be finalized and presented to the school board for their vote at a special meeting on February 26. The deadline to submit a ballot measure for the primary is February 28. The man known as the Nighttime Nailer and the Nail Bandit, who admitted to dumping large quantities of roofing nails on busy Oregon City roads on dozens of occasions, was sentenced last week before Clackamas County Circuit Judge Susie Norby. Brett Michael Wilson, 57, of Oregon City, had previously pleaded guilty to one count of second-degree criminal mischief and four counts of second-degree disorderly conduct. These were in connection with the case in which he admitted to sprinkling tacks and nails on at least 50 occasions over a two-year period. This resulted in countless blown tires and a reign of terror that affected virtually every driver in the local area. So we know what you're thinking. Did they nail him? Well, not exactly. He got 30 days in jail. Deputy District Attorney Brian Brock said Wilson also received 24 months of bench probation, meaning his behavior will be monitored by Judge Norby herself rather than a probation officer. He was also ordered to pay restitution to nine victims in the amount of $2,251.09. There were many more victims, Brock said, but for those whose fee for tire repair was small, or who even had the work done for free thanks to the generosity of Les Schwab, the hassle of seeking restitution was likely seen as not worth it. Wilson's sentence was not well received by many, although according to some online commenters, the death penalty would have been too lenient. As Brock explained, a 30-day jail sentence is actually an unusually stiff penalty for a misdemeanor conviction. That doesn't change the most common thing we've heard since Wilson's sentence was handed down. Only 30 days? People always react that way. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, there was actually a fair amount of pushback with it being even that high, but yeah, it's all relative. Um, but if you think about it, I mean, somebody goes and slashes your tires, let's say, and, you know, let's, that's, that happens, we get those. Right. You know, that person gets community service and, and they pay back the cost yeah. uh, of the tire. But once they do that, it's, you know, it's community service and, and then yeah. there's a conviction on your record, you know, which right. is not a good thing. So, you know, it's hard to equate apples and oranges, but 30 days was actually perceived as pretty high for someone who's throwing tax 
you know, on a road. The judge handed down the more serious sentence, Brock said, because of the length and extent of Wilson's behavior and the impact it had had on the community and the taxpayers. With many hours spent by Oregon City police and maintenance workers investigating his crimes and cleaning up the aftermath. Initially believed to have been active for about two years, Brock said Wilson claimed to have been scattering nails at various times for over a decade. He operated in the early morning hours pre-dawn, typically on his way to work. Brock said Wilson bought the roofing nails and other materials he used in his crime spree at the Home Depot and also at stores outside Oregon City so as to avoid being caught buying large amounts of nails. According to his own testimony, he went through about three large tubs of roofing nails every season, which for him meant fall, winter, and part of spring. He wouldn't do it in the summer because it got light too early, Brock said. His seasons were when it was dark enough to not be seen. Now, the big question. Why did he do it? Why did he wake up early, day after day, and drive the quiet streets of his own community, sprinkling nails and tacks with the expressed desire of popping his neighbor's tires, seriously inconveniencing them, and possibly much worse? According to Brock, it's because Wilson was angry. He was not choosing his victims. It was random. And they were not the people who were the individuals he was mad at. So it's uh, unusual in the sense that his anger at drivers was taken out on random people, unrelated, other than the fact that they were also motorists. Okay, so he he was angry at drivers. That was your understanding? That's what he said. Yeah, he just like road rage kind of stuff. People cut him I, off. I, I, people who were not courteous and would cut him off. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so he just directed that at any other drivers in the area that he saw. Yeah. Brock said Wilson told police he would be willing to write a letter of apology to his victims and admitted he hadn't fully thought through his actions and who it might affect. Emergency vehicles responding to a call, buses and parents carrying children to school, folks like him who were just trying to get to work on time. On the other hand, when asked if Wilson expressed remorse or seemed to regret his actions, Brock wasn't so sure. I don't know. You know, he's, I, I, you know, you can't, I can't read people. You know, he, yeah, yeah. he didn't say anything at sentencing. He didn't really address the court. Um, there was a victim there that relayed uh, how inconvenient this was as a single mom, you know, having to go in a couple of times to get her tires repaired. And one time had to, all three of them had to be replaced. She's one of the victims uh, on the restitution. And, uh, there wasn't really uh, any any you know response from him about that. So I you know I don't know. Judge Norby also ordered Wilson to undergo a mental health evaluation and to follow any course of treatment that is recommended. If he violates probation following his 30-day sentence, he could face up to an additional 11 months behind bars. It appears we will not see a repeat of what happened just before last year's football season, where an apparent miscommunication between Canby's outgoing city administrator and the school superintendent caused the district to, briefly, cancel its long-standing tradition of using fireworks to celebrate touchdowns at high school football games. The district reversed itself and reinstated the practice a few days later, but the public outcry due to the decision was remarkable. Local city and school officials were inundated with angry calls and emails. The Canby Now Facebook group pretty much melted down in a display that made the New Year's plastic bag debacle look like a dignified gentleman's disagreement. But we recovered. It all started with a request from Canby resident Paul Yelvisacker, who lives two blocks from Canby High School and suffers from chronic pain and PTSD that the random and unexpected explosions exacerbate. He presented a letter from his doctor verifying this condition, as well as a petition signed by over 50 other residents, two veterinary clinics, and a senior care facility. 
he asked the city council to change the local noise ordinance that currently allows the school district to use fireworks at football games and other sanctioned events. Ultimately, the football team was permitted to move forward with the tradition intact, and unfortunately for Mr. Yelvisacker and other residents who opposed the booms and bangs, with a reinvigorated offense that scored almost four times as many points as they had the previous season. Since then, Yelva Soccer has returned to city council on several occasions, re-entering his request and demanding action of some kind, or at least a response. At the city's last meeting, Mayor Brian Hodson checked his colleague's pulse for revisiting the noise ordinance. To a member, there seemed to be little appetite for change. Some, like councillors Trig Berge and Sean Barwig, said simply that they think the ordinance is just fine the way it is. Others, like Council President Tim Dale and Councillor Tracy Hensley, said they'd be willing to have a discussion, but didn't expect it to change their minds. Councillor Sarah Spoon echoed these sen sentiments, saying she does empathize with Mr. Yelvisacker. I would agree with Councillor Dale. I'm not really interested in changing the fairgrounds or the city fireworks. I don't think we've received complaints about them. I really empathize with the gentleman that came in. It hurts my heart every time he comes in and talks, but I'm not sure that my position would change overall. So if, if there's an appetite for a conversation, I'd have it. it I have a lot of empathy for him, so it's, you know, it's a challenging conversation, but um, I'm just not sure my opinion is going to change. Other counselors agreed, saying they felt they owed him a conversation and some closure on the matter. Councillor Spoon asked if there might be some room for some sort of compromise between the various parties, which she termed a win-win, such as the district using quieter fireworks. But Mayor Hodson said his understanding was they are already using the least concussive type of aerial fireworks on the market. Given the overall direction, Hodson said he would work with city staff to place the noise ordinance on a future agenda for discussion. A few years ago, coach Chuck McClarty practically had to beg for permission to establish the Canby High School's first trap shooting team. School officials were concerned that the sport used guns and were worried about injuries. But when McClarty showed how fast the sport is growing in high schools across the country and shared actual data on trap shooting injuries versus those of much more common sports and especially contact sports like football, they relented. Since then, the Cougar trap shooting team has been taking aim at establishing itself as one of the premier programs in the state and nation. They blasted onto the country's biggest stage last year with several impressive performances in the USA Clay Target High School National Championships, not least of which was the dominance of pint size then-junior Isabella Berge. Berge put on a clinic, hitting a perfect 100 targets in a row one of only seven out of the field of 1,700 competitors to accomplish the rare feat, and the only girl. In so doing, she made a strong case for being the top female amateur trap shooter in the country. The high school team has several other seasoned shooters who will also be looking to make some noise in this year's national championships. But they may have already found their next big thing in the form of 12-year-old 6th grader Aiden Greisenauer. Eamon Aiden, who's coached by both McClarity and his father, Wayne Greisenauer, has been shooting for just over the past year. But he's already accomplished something that many shooters with years or even decades more experience have failed to accomplish. Shoot a perfect round 25 for 25. Actually, he's done it twice. Here's Wayne during a recent interview after practice at the Canby Rodden Gun Club. So please forgive the background noise. Yeah. A bank of trap is 25 birds. So right. The 25 straight means you shot all 25, didn't miss. That's that's good. It's big for a six or a 12 year old, especially. There's some like grown shooters that have been shooting for years that can't do that. Is that right? There's guys that shoot their whole life and never do that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but he's got good eyes, young, and picked up and got the stance and the form and shoots well. So he's already done it twice now. So twice. Yeah. He just did it the other day. 
This year, 6th, 7th, and 8th graders are being allowed to compete with the high school team, something Wayne said is pretty exciting for the youngsters. Aiden has been practicing hard twice a week with the goal of competing with and against shooters with several years on him in terms of age and experience. He's been putting in the work, Coach McClarity says. He's been showing up every Tuesday and Thursday. For a sixth grader, he is shooting amazing. As eye-opening as his shooting has been, McClarity said he has been just impressed by the preteen's growth and maturity on the range. I've seen big changes from when Aiden started shooting, he says. I think trap shooting has really helped him. Aiden has a very good start on becoming one of the best. If he keeps practicing, the sky's the limit. In addition to competing with the Camby Cougar trap shooting team this season, he'll join Wayne at a number of competitions organized by Rita, the Western Regional Independent Trap Shooting Association, where he'll see some of the country's best amateur and professional shooters in action. Whether he ends up going in the sport, he's beaten one of the best, his own coach and grandfather. He'll have his opportunity to win a few medals and prizes and things like that and shoot with some pretty pretty uh, seasoned kids across the state so it that's all in like league basketball or baseball or whatever you know it's taking it to the next level so as a 12 year old I fully expect him by the time he enters high school to be at the national level so that's what we're shoot, shooting for right now shooting for a good one well I'm gonna go way out on a limb here and say you're, you're pretty proud of your grandson Yes, I'm very proud of him. In fact, tonight we were shooting games out here and he shot me out, put me on the porch. So <laughs> that's the first time he's managed that. <laughs> Pretty funny. Yeah. Trap shooting is one of the fastest growing sports in the state and nation. McClarity says there are now 43 Oregon high schools that have formed trap shooting teams. He expects between 800 and 1,000 student athletes to be competing in the state this year. Cami Now Sports is brought to you by Reif and Hunziker, PC. When you need an attorney, turn to the firm Camby has trusted for over 50 years. Call them today at 503-266-3456. It was the moment many of our local student athletes have been working towards all season. The chance to go toe-to-toe -to -toe against some of the top competition in the state as the Three Rivers League District Championships for swimming and wrestling were held this weekend. Of course, our Cougars made us proud and many will be moving on to the next level. In wrestling, the big story was senior Kaden McMullen, who took home the regional title after defeating number one ranked Cole Brink by fall in the 138 pound weight class. Senior Logan Doman, wrestling at 182, also made it to the finals but he lost by decision to Westland's Cade Miller. Both will move on to the OSAA State Championship on February 28 and 29 at the Veterans Memorial Coliseum in Portland. Also qualifying were Ethan Unsred, Nick Marquez, Asher Chafee, Dominic Netter, Caden Boyd, and Brent Patterson, who all placed third in their weight classes to punch their tickets to state. As a team, Canby finished second behind tournament champion Wes Lynn. In swimming, the Canby girls swim team has been impressing all season. They did not win a single meet all last year, while this season they took four of seven. That success continued on Saturday as the Cougars qualified for state in both the 200 medley relay, while setting a new school record in the process, and the 400 freestyle relay. Senior Marin Chard and freshman Avery Kinonen also qualified as individuals in the 100 Butterfly. The Canby Stunt and Sideline team also qualified for and competed in the 2020 OSAA State Cheerleading Championship at the Veterans Coliseum this Saturday. And though the results didn't turn out the way we would have wanted, we're so proud of the hard work these athletes have put in all season. Thank you for representing our community at the state level. On the hardwood this week, the Canby boys showed a remarkable turnaround. They'd held their heads high through a four-game skid in Three Rivers League play, which had included a 46-47 heartbreaker they dropped to Tigard at home the previous week. 
This week, they kicked things off with Lake Ridge at home, and the poor Pacers, who are winless in league this season, didn't know what they were getting themselves into. The Cougs blew the doors off the gym, taking the game 75-47 and snapping the losing streak in emphatic fashion. They followed it up with a road contest against Oregon City, always a tough draw. But they hung tight and pulled out a second straight win, 55-53, to to improve to a 5-4 in the Three Rivers. The girls also defeated Lake Ridge and were in the midst of a four-game winning streak when they rolled into OC on Friday. The Cougs had bested the Pioneers in their first matchup in January, but Oregon City has been red hot lately, climbing to sixth in the state rankings and winning their last five games. Facing Canby for the second time, it seemed like the girls from Oregon City had forgotten how to miss shots. They took the game 48-31. to Another pair of Three Rivers League doubleheaders this week as the Cougars face tough road matchups against West Lynn on Tuesday. But the girls and boys teams are ranked in the top 10. Then wrap things up at home against Tualatin on Friday. Tip-off will be at 5.45 for the boys and 7.15 for the girls. Hey, Tyler, I have to tell you about something. All right. This buddy of mine was telling me his internet bill went up right after the holidays. Can you believe it? I'm sorry, what? I know. Talk about a Grinch move, am I right? Why would their bill go up at that time of year, Frankie? Well, they said it was because of overage fees from going over their data cap. Probably because they had family home for the holidays with way more people than usual using their Wi-Fi. Think about it. You've got kids playing games online, parents streaming TV shows and movies, plus all of the devices everyone has that are connected to the Wi-Fi network. That's a lot of stuff using up data, and they were charged extra for it. That's super weird. I didn't even know there were like actual things called data caps for internet providers. I use a ton of data every month right here in the studio. And I've never seen an extra fee. Yeah, that's because we have Direct Link. With them, not only will we never be charged extra fees for using lots of data at any speed, but they also never slow down our internet speed for high usage. It's all part of their commitment to unlimited internet. Oh, that's right. That's right. Well, hey, I mean, it sounds like your friend should switch over to Direct Link. Yeah, no kidding. We'd like to extend our undying gratitude to the Canby Now Plus member, Rocket Stitches. Coolest name ever. We rely on your monthly contributions to continue to do this work that we love, and we really love doing it. To find out how you can become one of the coolest people in the world, one of our supporters on Patreon, visit canbynowpod.com slash plus. Thank you for listening to the Now Podcast. Welcome back, listeners. My guest on the Camry Conversation today is my co-host, Tyler Clawson. Uh, yeah, I'm one of them. Hey, how's it going? It's going. I'm trying to do producer things and bring down that music. Yeah, there, there you go. go. You did it. I you did, did it. it. <laughs> Happy Valentine's Day. Yeah. It's been a few days. A couple days. But the feelings of love and romance are still flowing. At least they are here and now here in the studios. Yeah, they are. We have... A very special guest. So excited to introduce my wife. No. My wife. Try it again. Yeah, there yeah. you go. Can you edit that out? Yeah, I can edit that out. <laughs> I'm actually going to leave it in. But oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. I, uh, you always just leave it in. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Joelle Frankie. Hi. Hi. How's it going? It's <laughs> great. Welcome to Now Here the Studios. Here for the second time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it took a, took a while. So, um, yeah. How was your Valentine's Day? Yeah, I can was... see why you guys are just just the I know. best conversationalist. The, the romance, <laughs> the the chemistry is just like Undeniable. oh my gosh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Like, can you <laughs> pull the blinds from the studio for a minute? Yeah, I'm we'll... sorry, I just gotta leave. <laughs> Let you guys do your thing. Valentine's was fun. We do a. Um, hey, why it's don't your... you let me? Tell it okay. Since oh, yeah. here we go. Yeah, we here do. we go. Here we go. This is what this is just going to be like. So. <laughs> well, you said it's your tradition, and then you start telling yeah, about my no, tradition. It's my please, tradition. I'll, please I'll tell. tell. Will you please about tell it? me. Tell me about your tradition. Counseling with Frankie. <laughs> so welcome to a brand new podcast, everyone. <laughs> we have been. It's going to be so many spinoffs from from this. Yeah. 
Well, um, when I was little, my family would do pink everything for dinner. So pink mashed potatoes, beets, pink milk, and a heart-shaped hamburger mm-hmm. with ketchup. And just playing the band Pink just yeah, all day just long. All, just all day long. All day. Mm, yeah, no, constantly. No, Hot Pink not. Turtle. <laughs> that was a band. <laughs> that was a thing. <laughs> yeah. And um, I had never heard of a family tradition like that, and I think it's really cool. And um, the, the pink mashed potatoes are really, really fun. Upgrade to steak, though, because... Yes, we did. <laughs> we did. We did step it up from you, hamburger, You too. made pink steak? Well... Heart-shaped. Yeah. So the, the thing with the burgers is heart-shaped. Oh, uh, okay. And yeah. then, well, if you want your steak good, yeah, it's going to have some pink, so... Sure. There was one year we, we sort of tried to make them heart-shaped, but they just look mangled and... Yeah, and then you lose some of the steak, and it's like, well, just it's an abstract heart. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, on this segment, we're going to be sharing some date stories. Yeah, and the original idea was to have both the wives here, but of right. course, of course, of Becca course. wouldn't co- cooperate. No, she never does. That's mean. She's not <laughs> no, kidding at all. <laughs> she's feeling she's so, nice she's you. feeling so bad. Yeah. Well, and she and I both like all weekend Friday night. She wasn't feeling great because she actually works in the floral department at Fred Meyer. Mm-hmm. So she has to deal with Valentine's Day. She doesn't get to enjoy. <laughs> Right, Valentine's Day. So she gets home, and I, and we're trying to make it a romantic evening, but eventually, it caught up with both of us, especially her. And at like seven o'clock, yeah, <laughs> she's like, "I'm going to bed." Yeah, I I'm f- done. for her Valentine's Day it would be like, um, I feel like Halloween for like a uh, mascot. Yeah. You know, like I dress up like an animal all the time. Or like, Veterans <laughs> Day for you. <laughs> right, yeah. Because yeah. Yeah. I work at ODVA where every day is Veterans Day. But that we, used to be our motto. <laughs> yeah. But we, yeah, so Friday night kind of, you know, it fizzled out pretty quick with her being super tired. And then yesterday we went out and enjoyed the day. But eventually I, I caught something. I don't know what it was. And I wasn't feeling good. So basically by 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock, I was in bed, not feeling good, uh, and then up all night, really not feeling good. And then today she gets up and we're like, all right, today we're doing it. Valentine's Day. It's going to be our (laughs) Valentine's Day. (laughs) And then she's like, I got a migraine. This is not good. Mm -hmm. And we tried to get on top of it, but it just didn't work out. So we will, you know, we Valentine's Day is just an excuse for us to have fun. Right. It doesn't. It's not the only time that we enjoy our marriage. So it's whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, the way you're describing like migraines and, you know, f- going to sleep at six o'clock just sounds like married dates to me. So, yeah, I, I guess <laughs> pretty maybe, much sums it up. <laughs> maybe. Yeah, I guess. You don't have kids yet. Wait, wait till they come. No, no. We're, we're good for yeah. the moment. <laughs> well, with uh, those romantic stories already under our belt. Of yeah. <laughs> hot, hot dates. Joel, any, any date stories you would want to share from just you know, your husband or whomever, I guess. Well, um, I'm thinking to that first trip I made out to Maine. Um, so, so I was living in, in Maine at the time and, uh, yeah, I mean, get it, get some tissues ready. These yeah. are going to be some romantic, mm-hmm. some tear jerkers. So yeah, definitely. Yeah. 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 It was in December during winter break while I was at college. Mm-hmm. Your your first visit to Maine? Yeah, and I knew, I knew it was going to be cold, and I'm from Canby, so I brought my warmest clothes. I got me some jeans and my <laughs> Columbia jacket. Long pants and... And t-shirts. T-shirts. So, and went to Maine. And um, it was 60 below with wind chill, and um, yeah, I was freezing. Yeah, so that week ended up being um, record-breaking cold. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Where we lived in Maine. Uh, the, the thing I remember the most from that week is, you know, we lived in Maine, uh, so we had, like, the the industrial, like, military-grade um, antifreeze, like, for our cars and, and windshield uh, stuff for our cars, and th- that was freezing. Like, oh, what? Yeah, in the tanks, yeah. That's yeah. nuts. Yeah, yeah, it was, like, good to, like, good to, like, Antarctica. Oh, no, not this. Can't handle this, so. <laughs> After this visit, I did buy some warmer boots to wear next time. But yeah. <laughs> meanwhile, I just had tennis shoes. Tennis shoes, some jeans. You, you were doing a lot of layers, but, yeah, you were really cold that trip. Well, I didn't have layers, like, not, like, Pants that go under pants. It just had pants. Right. I mean, they were just, just layer, a regular just layers. Of layers. Yeah. <laughs> yes. just layer layers. 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 The kind of, of t-shirts. layers you would wear in 
in Oregon Can be. winter. Yeah, because yeah. I knew cold. Yeah. yeah. We're at the same parallel, so it seemed like it shouldn't be too bad. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, you can't really layer a t-shirt. I mean, it's like, okay, my chest is warm, but these arms still don't have anything on them. Yeah. Well, yeah. You, can, you can do like a... You, first you have long johns on and then a, a long sleeve shirt over that and then like a raglan baseball t-shirt uh, over that and then over that you have a regular t-shirt and then you have like a uh, sleeveless t-shirt and then you have a tank top yeah so you get a whole rainbow of you shirt colors the bra, so there's always that <laughs> um also i was living in a really weird house a uh, really weird living situation. I was living with nine other men <gasps> in um, like this historic house that was made to just have like three or four bedrooms. Yeah. Um, so we we made bedrooms out of things that were not meant to be bedrooms. <laughs> My bedroom was the like parlor. Yes, was a parlor. It was like a sitting room. It did not. It had. Um, it had double door. It was a small room, but it had like double sun doors, and it was like full glass. Like, not no lock, right. not even wood on the doors. It's a glass <laughs> door. Um, so I just, like, uh, tacked up some, uh, you know, in true college fashion, like, tacked up some cheap sheets from Walmart over the windows. Oh, you did um, sheets. I straight, you, you spent some money. I went for a bath shower curtain. Right. Like, I didn't even get the sheets. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm pretty, pretty upscale, so... Yeah. Um, they weren't even on clearance. Not, not that I'm bragging, but, um, but yeah, like no, no heat in that room. Like it was not designed to be slept in. So, yeah. Well, you took me to the coast. Mm -hmm. That's what you Easterners call it. Yeah. Um, That's what we call it too. Well, I call yeah, it the every, beach. Everyone. I say the that. beach. And you then... say the beach in Oregon. Yeah. All right. And say the coast. Going to the coast. Beck and I always say the coast. Well, that's not the Becca I know. So. Oh. In, in Maine, I I think a beach has sand. Like that that to me is a beach. And yeah. Mo, like like ninety nine percent of the uh, places where water meets land in Maine are rock rocky. Yeah. So that to me is a coast. Yeah. He went yeah. and took me to the rocks that met the ocean. And he found me. Um, you know, it was really pretty. It was very cold. Yeah, I just pretended well, like everything just, was grand. Yeah, we're walking around. We're having a, a little romantic time. Um, it's probably the first, like, maybe slightly non miserable time you were having in Maine. And I never see shells on the beach. Um, we weren't even like on the beach. We we're like the, we were, we're on the rocks. We're yeah, at we're Haycock Head. Yeah, climbing up on this head, climbing up on some rocks, and I found a shell. And it wasn't like it's a nice big white cock. nice big beautiful shell, and it's just like you know, in my romantic like this is just this is for Joelle, you know, this yeah. is just to make make it special. So I presented it to you, and you put it in my pocket. Uh, very happily, smittenly put it in your pocket. Yeah, and we kept walking. Kind of exaggerating, but yeah. Well, you have to do that on a podcast. Yeah, oh. you got to create a word you painting. Do. You do. Here's a word painting. <laughs> Shell in the pocket. <laughs> what could go wrong? So we finished up our walk, got back in the truck. Um, I just had my pickup truck at that time that only had the cab. So we're all smushed in together with our bags and stuff. And you were taking up. me to um, a some triple, friends. double date? Yep, some friends. Some weird college friends. Very, very weird. The and heats. it was like a three-hour drive. Yeah. Heat's blasting. Was it? Did it start to happen in the truck? Yeah. Well, let me. Uh, so, I'm sitting there <laughs> wearing my coat, my only coat, the best coat, and noticing I'm getting kind of wet. There's this smell. It's very foul. It's very dead like and <laughs> earthy. It is the worst smell. It is a terrible, anyway, terrible smell. It just keeps getting worse. And then we finally arrive at the place where all the people are and, and neither of us are talking about this horrible because like you, you know, know i think so... i mentioned like i don't know why i'm wet like what what is <laughs> what is on my shirt like what is this and oh, finally gosh, get out of the vehicle so and bad. i stand up and then i put my hand into my pocket because my hands were cold and it's squelched in there <laughs> and then we start going up the steps to meet his friends as i'm like discovering this and <clears throat> I'm like, uh, looked in the pocket and there's this goo 
is coming out of the shell oh, and there's these no. iridescent claws. Yeah. Like it was a hermit crab that had died many moons ago and had <laughs> frozen to death in a shell. I mean, it might have died for another reason. No, no, it died cold. It's <laughs> freaking cold in Maine. It's the worst. And then it's it's now defrosted in my pocket along with a cup full of ocean mm-hmm. and it's all over me my coat is wet my shirt is wet my pants are wet and i'm gonna go meet people for the first time mm-hmm. and i don't like meeting new people yeah it's not a thing i like to do yeah but i'm doing it because i liked you right well i still like you but i really liked. really you know trying to impress you yeah um and then people started trying to hug me and i said don't <laughs> don't hug me like they're you know i smell like ocean death <laughs> get back and so they brought me inside uh they're pretty eccentric girls there's three three mm-hmm. girls three guys and mm-hmm. yeah, they, they started were, spraying me down with they febreze were, they were odd ducks <laughs> and took my coat away and then we had dinner getting to know everyone and um decided to they go took your coat away to wash it no not to wash it just to put it in the other room while they sprayed it down with febreze oh i thought they were washing it no they're not that i awful. remember them as being less i remember them as being more normal they were not normal <laughs> and then they decided we're gonna go bowling right <laughs> and so we have to go back out in this 60 degree weather and you to don't get have in a coat car. i hate bowling yeah. i've got these stubby you thumbs. don't like bowling i've got these stubby thumbs so like they're short they're yeah. shorter than normal, she has to and get, they're wider than. I, let me. I'm yeah, me. She has to get yeah. like a like That's a Hulk what I was gonna say. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I have to get a really big ball for these thumbs, because they don't make. Yeah, and yeah. and then I can't roll it very well because it's too big for me. <laughs> and plus, think of the bacteria in there; it's just yeah. gross. Super cute. Long story short, bowling alley was closed, so we went to Walmart. Well, no, Walmart. first these girls are like girl car, and so we have right. to. I have to get, <laughs> and so on your Valentine's date, you ended up with just a bunch of girls and a car and a, separate from. And it gets yeah, worse well, because I, I was with a bunch of dudes. They said, so. mm. "Go get your coat." And I was like, no, I'm not getting my coat. And they're like, okay, <laughs> you're weird. And I'm like, it, 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 it's soaking wet with mm-hmm. ocean death and mm-hmm. Febreze. Mm-hmm. Get mm-hmm. me another coat. But I didn't. I wasn't brave you enough to ask for a different yeah. co- coat. Then they just ran out the door and told me I was weird. But yeah. so I'm not had, putting that back on. Had I had no, no coat. coat. Yeah. I had a t-shirt yeah. and pants in 60 degree weather. Minus Below. 60. Minus yeah. 60. There we go. Yeah. 60 Big would difference. be nice. Yeah. Oh. Huge. <laughs> <laughs> and then we get in this car and these girls are like, well, tell us about yourself. What makes you worthy? Uh. And uh, so I start telling my story and then one of them starts crying. And I'm like, uh. and then oh, yeah. the other one, the other one goes, <laughs> don't stop talking. Don't stop talking. You have no idea what your words mean. And I'm like, well, I thought it meant I was just telling a story about us and how we met. But don't okay. And so anyway, they start praying. Like we get, we, we did the bowling alley is close. So we go to Walmart and they start praying uh-huh. and holding my hands and then like it, it keeps going on and on and then the guys are all standing outside our car at this point kind of tapping on the window and i looked at frankie and i was like i these are your friends i don't <laughs> they were, know they were acquaintances. what's happening so then at the end of the prayer she was like that's it i know i was gonna break up with my boyfriend but now after you talked we're getting married yes. and so what? she yes. she grabs my arm <laughs> And we get linked in arm in arm, and we go skipping into Walmart. She tracks down her man. She takes off his ring that he's wearing, puts it on his, um, you know, ring finger, and proposes. Yeah. Right then and there. What in the Walmart? <laughs> what? Yeah, that yeah. was that was like one of our first dates. Yeah, just based off Joel talking, and and they're like, "You have no idea. This was exactly what I needed to hear." And it's like, mm, it was okay. about me. Yeah. I was talking about me yeah. and my life, and yeah. I, I know I'm amazing and stuff, but oh, God, what in the world, man. Uh, yeah, and funny. we didn't get, we didn't even get invited to that wedding. Like, I feel no, like didn't. after I know we totally should this have. this service, the I wedding think, that you created. I exactly. know. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. How do you flip like that, though? I was going to break up m- with my boyfriend, but now I'm going to marry him. Right. That's a. <sighs> that's not. That's. That's a big jump. Like not even a. I was gonna break up with him, but now I'll, I'll stick with him. See how it goes. Yes. It's. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's commitment time. That's what that was. We yeah. weren't even engaged. We were. Um, my first trip to Maine. Right. So. Well, that's cool. Yeah. Fun times, guys. I know. I know. Yeah. Fun stories. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Avoiding breakups, making people get married. Yeah. yeah. Well, we would would love to at this point here and talk about 
Becca and Tyler story, but I guess we'll have to do that at another I time. I could tell the whole tale. You could tell it from Joelle's point seat. of view. Yeah, Joelle's perspective. I know, right? <laughs> yeah. How the Clausens became them. The, the Clausens? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. How the Clausens spirits became just Clausens. Stay tuned for the sequel, folks. <laughs> well, how much time do we have? Uh, Not a lot. Not a lot. Because that was 15 full minutes of one story. Okay. Okay. And I can do some quick ones here. From- yeah. Do it. These are fun. These are fun. I okay. want to read the one gif that that one dude shared. That That's not a gif. That's a meme. But meme. Yeah. Whatever. Okay. It's the same thing. Uh, well, let's see. Um, this one's from Canby. Uh, we asked just folks for their best, you know, Canby dates. Could be best. Could be worst. Could be funniest. You know, just, just some stories we wanted to hear. Um, this is from Becky Davis. She says, I was friends with the bartender at Mike's Place. I mean, what could be more romantic? Yeah. yeah Mike's yeah, Place. Canby location. Am I right, Joelle? Definitely the best bar she, in she, Canby she's, on Second she's Street, nodding on the north. Oh, side just of a town. stone's throw from where we are, where we sit right now, babe. Uh, yeah. Maybe I'll take you there after if you're lucky. Oh, uh, you're in for a treat, Joelle. So most nights I went, and did I say she was friends with the bartender at Mike's, and she didn't like closing up alone. So most nights I went and sat with her until she closed. It was a rowdy weekend, and the bar was full. There, I feel like should I. Do like a sexy voice when I'm reading this. No, Why? I know. There was a guy in there I'd been making yeah. eyes at for a couple of weeks. He was at the jukebox, and the bartender said, "I dare you to go kiss that guy," and so I did. Next month, we will be married at 20 years. Wow, it's a good one. Yeah, yeah. Mm. There's actually like several stories very similar to that. To that. Um, so if that gives you any indication of what Camby's like. Wow. Um, Someone came up to me and said he liked me, and I punched him. Yeah. <laughs> Skylar B. Lynn says, me and my wife, Samantha Lynn, ditched the dance when we went when we were in high school 12 years ago and had a picnic. Music and picnic. dance by ourselves at Wait Park Gazebo. Oh, then that's we where went you bowling. and Becca like to go. Mm. Becca and I, instead of I going to a I feel like a, a lot dance, of romance has happened at the gazebo, don't you think? When, that's a oh, yeah, that's a classic gazebo yeah. or romantic <laughs> classic place. gazebo um, <laughs> such a classic gazebo that classic that gazebo. gazebo that gazebo man uh <laughs> it just comes into the room like uh, a sitcom <laughs> classic everybody, gazebo. Yeah. beck and i skipped a dance one time that all of our friends wanted us to go to and instead we went and saw a heavy metal band and that's kind of when i knew i felt i was in love with her mm, nice. that's pretty awesome nice yeah the most surprising thing to me about that story is that it didn't have a bunch of people responding to it saying oh i miss bowling and oh we need a bowling alley in camping right yeah and um, you just got to jump on that when you can get which it which one should we have joel read cassie cassie it, oh cassie vanderpool that yeah that would be a good like one. one sentence yeah no, it's this one right here you can see it <laughs> Do I say the person's name? Yes. yes. I, well, we just said oh. it, but you can go oh. ahead and say it again. Yeah. Cassie I Vanderpool. Like, she's. I think she's the president of the Moms Club. I don't know. Club, I just or... keep getting HIPAA in my head, so I'm like, you're not allowed to disclose names. Yeah, that we don't. We're not under HIPAA. Yeah, <laughs> we're not Sorry. doctors. We're mandatory reporters, but in, <laughs> in a different way. Uh, my husband and I met working at Fur Point Farms. It's a Love fun place. Point. Yeah. The summer after we graduated graduated high school i chased him for three months afterwards trying to get him to agree to hang out with me he had an accident one day involving a gas can and a burn barrel what (laughs) my brother did something like that burned his face and ended up in the er oh smart one they gave him some good meds and (laughs) and (laughs) some of the sort he finally agreed to let me come over that was just over 10 years ago, and we haven't been apart since. Yeah. Thank goodness for gas fires. I know. And meds. And bur- burning <laughs> his face off. Yeah. Some of these are really good. They're a little bit long. Some I seriously, these. I laughed so hard when I first saw this this meme sure. <laughs> from Austin <laughs> Despin. Despin? Despan? Sorry, Austin. I'm going to get your name I'm wrong. I'm 100% sure his last name is not pronounced Dustpan. Dustpan. I didn't say Pan. Dustpan. I said Despin. Whatever. Uh, basically, can be in a nutshell, and it says uh, it's got a guy standing by his truck, <laughs> shirtless, with a mullet, and it says we broke up, but she said we could still be cousins. Yeah, I laughed when I heard that one too. Yeah, sorry, we mangled your name, Austin. I'm, I know it's not Dustpan. Austin Dustpan. I did like. Oh, I just lost my stories. I liked uh, David Nicodemus. He was on duty as a police officer in Gladstone, and he stopped her for speeding with no ticket. 
and that's all it took. 51, 51 years ago. Uh, wow. Married, or fifty married fifty one years ago last week. All right, Joy, I highlighted your next one. Okay. Heather Dome. Dorn. Dorn. Yeah. Oh. I'm not the only one. Yes. Well, it's far away. I'm not. So like, we love Heather. Uh, she's one of the owners Dorn. of the Canby Liquor Store, our new sponsor ah, this week. There we go. So. I see the R now. Yeah. I just happened to buy my first house next door to a hot guy. It took us three months to meet, and we went on our first date just a few weeks after. Our neighbors all made fun of us in the mornings watching us take turns at the lock Oh, that's shade. funny. <laughs> oh. <laughs> they must be, like, looking out the window a lot to see that because it would be such a short walk. You yeah. Know? Nosy people. <laughs> it's candy. Luckily, we got to invite all of them to our wedding so they could share their stories to our families. Mm, nice. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Let's hear it for Heather and KB Liquor Store. Yay! Yay! We love you. Um... I'm going to do one more, and then, uh, Tyler, you want to do Sarah's? Sure. Okay. So I really liked David Fife's. He, um, so I, this really has nothing to do with Camby, but he did share it in Camby Now, and he said our first date started on Oahu's North Shore, watching the waves at Pipeline, ended up at a rock and roll bar in Pearl City where someone tossed a grenade to shake things up, going on 35 years of marriage, what a way to get it started and I asked like are you serious you know somebody tossed a grenade and he said yes several people were hurt not critical locals are aren't always friendly to the military to be honest we had consumed quite a bit of alcohol by this time and when walking out noticed several people lying on the ground getting treated but I thought it was just a fight I read about it the next day in the paper Obviously, the music was pretty loud. I thought a grenade explosion is pretty hard to beat. <laughs> yeah, pretty for much. Story. That's, That's like, like something for like a heart's <laughs> war or something know, like that. Right? Isn't that meant to like kill? Not just like knock a few people over yeah no grenades are like no joke. joke it's not yeah. it's, that's usually not like oh what is what a character third grenade like yeah yeah <laughs> okay yeah friend of the show sarah spoon waffle yeah sarah and chris and if you've ever met them you know that they are this story makes perfect sense for their personalities yes <laughs> like they are two people who you fall in love with and they fall in love with you very quickly i, so. I do require you to read the emoji as well in, oh of in, course in, i will in the story okay uh, Sarah Spoon Waffle. <clears throat> Chris and I met at a convention and we stayed up all night talking in the lobby like teenagers. We fell in love over topics like Country Bear Jamboree is grossly underrated and why does General Grievous use a lightsaber? He did not train in the ways of the dark oh side gosh, or of the force. Right? That night we planned our wedding. We would run to Las Vegas and m get married by Elvis. We lived a thousand miles apart and both had kids and exes whom we would never try to move our kids away from. It seemed impossible. We got engaged two months after we met. He moved to Canby three months after that. His, ama he, his amazing kids and his lovely wife moved here too. Uh, Ex-wife. I'm sorry. Yes, I read it too quickly. I was moving on. And his amazing... <laughs> totally, <laughs> totally, totally changes the story. Totally changes the story. Totally changes If you don't. But and, that part in. And we were married by Elvis in Vegas 10 months after we met, just as we had planned the night we met. Heart emoji. Thank you very much. Yeah, and there was a great... I guess I forgot to grab the picture, but there was a great picture they posted too uh, yeah. from the wedding, which is pretty and, cute. You so. know, I, I totally identify with this. Beck and I, like... To this day, still get in not arguments all the time. Sometimes they're arguments. Sometimes they're just discussions <laughs> of nerdy things like who would win in a fight between Lord Voldemort and Darth Vader. Yeah, uh, that's been a contention in our relationship for a very long time. But right. there's a lot of other stuff. So I think that's why Beck and I really like Sarah and Chris because we can definitely see like what the appeal is in two nerds just nerding out together for all of life. Yeah, now I'm feeling really awkward because we've had discussions like that as well. <laughs> <laughs> it's why you're one of my best friends. <laughs> <laughs> so, Joel, what did you think of your first appearance on the Can Be Now podcast? Are you, do you finally understand what this is all about? We're just sitting here talking by ourselves, <laughs> being recorded. That the is... only difference is being recorded. Yeah, you just described a podcast. That is literally <laughs> what a podcast is. Well, okay. I mean, if you like got paid for it or something, it'd make sense. But uh, I mean, we're we're working on we're, it. We're trying. Okay. <laughs> so if you want to become a Patreon, <laughs> <laughs> if you want our wives to understand more why we do this. Okay, well, that was really fun. Thank you guys for sharing your stories, as always. Um, it's one of my favorite 
things to do. We did the this last year as well, and love hearing yeah. hearing folks hearing about life in Canby. Um, you gonna outro us? We need like some romantic music to outro. Oh, this, so. I'll go find some romance music and should just... we pretend like we're hearing it? Like, oh, that's perfect. Oh, that's yeah. so good. Yeah. Oh, oh no, nailed it. Oh, like Becca was here. We could have sung. Song, a song. Oh, well, so again, there will be a sequel, y'all. <laughs> so we got a lot more of Cami Now podcast to listen. Stay tuned. I'm here with Derek Hill at Advantage Mortgage, and you had some advice you were wanting to put out there to prospective home buyers. Yeah, you know it's so crazy out there right now. The um, the housing market is just blazing fast especially in the first time home buyer range of prices oh cool so it's imperative that you find out all the the ins and outs you know how much can you afford what's your payment range that you want to be in what type of loan program you're qualified for because there's a lot of no money down loan programs that are available but they really might not be best for you um in my experience those those loans um, have an increased payment that if they had a little bit of money down, they wouldn't need. But the great thing about Canby is it's eligible for the USDA loan program, which is a no money down loan. But um, my point is, it's just super important to get it figured out before you start looking because I've seen customers go find the house they love they and they call me and they're like, you know, let's go, let's go. Right. And then by the time we get everything dialed in, which can be in four hours, yeah. that house is gone. Yeah. And so it's just way better. Uh, so I just want to make sure that consumers know, give us a call. Just give us, you know, let's meet, let's talk about it, let's get everything dialed in so that you know exactly what you're up against, and then you're ready. You can make that offer and kaflui, you know what I mean? Yeah. And people can find you on your website or just give you a call? Uh, yeah, they can go to findtheadvantage.com or call 266-5800, obviously 503 area code. Um, and we love to chit chat and we have, you know, eight or nine different loan officers here in the Canby office that would love to sit down with somebody and work with them. Cool. Thanks, Derek. Derek Hill, NMLS number 50183, Advantage Mortgage, NMLS number 177059, equal housing opportunity. Joining me on the line now is Mike Schmader. He is uh, formerly the Grand Knight of the local chapter of the Knights of Columbus here in Canby, currently the chairman of their annual crab dinner and charity auction. Mike, can you start by telling us just a little bit about the Knights of Columbus uh, here in Canby and the work that you do? Yes, the Knights of Columbus is a fraternal men's organization through the Catholic Church. Um, It was founded in 1882 back in New Haven, Connecticut by uh, Father Michael J. McGivney, and what he wanted to do by starting this organization was provide kind of support and assistance to widows and members of his local parish back there who were coming on hard times. And so the, the founding principles he tried to instill were charity, unity, and fraternity. So the charitable part is what we mostly see today uh, through our good works of the Knights of Columbus. We... Um, we currently have just over 2 million members worldwide. Wow. In, yes, encompassing 10 countries. And in Canby alone, we have about 120 members. And our, our main focus is just raising money and, and, and helping out through you know charitable works of any sort to help those organizations and individuals who are less fortunate or kind of down on their luck. And we have quite a few local charities that we donate to um the oregon food bank in, in canby here we donate for them and these oregon special olympics the boy scouts of america uh the american wheelchair mission the canby center which is uh, a great organization that helps needy families mm-hmm. uh the canby pregnancy care center and also we donate money for canby high school scholarships and our religious education program at St. Patrick Church in Canby, and Father Taft Homes for young women who were kind of struggling in life, uh, and a lot of them are homeless, and, and they just they just need a helping hand. And this home is, is a great 
resource for them to kind of get back on their feet and get things kind of squared away in their lives. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it's a great organization. It's, you know, some of the more noted Knights of Columbus, a lot of people don't realize that uh, John F. Kennedy was in the Knights of Columbus. Mm. Uh, Vince Lombardi, Babe Ruth, Mike Ditka. I mean, these are all, uh, you know, big names that people <laughs> right. have noticed. But yeah, but yeah, it's just a fantastic organization and um, it's definitely faith-based and I'm very proud to be a, be a member of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I love that. I love all the different organizations that you touch. It sort of is like, a, you know, um, it, it kind of a, a donation to you guys is like a gift that keeps on giving. It doesn't just help one organization kind of gets dispersed uh, throughout many, many very worthy causes uh, in our community, mm-hmm. which yes. is awesome. I think one of them that you might have missed, Mike, I remember being mentioned um, in the program is the Share the Warmth program here in town through yes, KB Utility. Yeah, and I, I like just wanted to bring that up because you guys kind of share the love as well. So, Yeah. Yeah. We don't need to share the warrant we have for quite some time now. And that's a, that's a great organization. Uh, you know, there's also a Canby all night high school graduation party. That's right. That we don't do as well. And uh, yeah, we, we try to, we try to, you know, donate locally, but we also have some, some outside the community donations we give to, we give to a lot of uh, uh, VA um, oh, cool! Veteran past too. So mm-hmm. yeah, it's so we we try to spread the love. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, um, this year was our first year uh, going to the, your annual uh, charity di- a charity auction and crab dinner at the Clackamas County Fairgrounds. I know you've been doing that for one some time. Where does the name come from? Is it named after Christopher Columbus? Yes, it's it's named after Christopher Columbus um, for his pretty much for his adventure is you know is, is a sense of adventure mm. and going off into the unknown mm-hmm. and 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 so we kind of the organization michael j mcgivney you know kind of chartered him as our founding name and uh you know sadly there's been a lot of bad press about Christopher right that's <laughs> right that's why i wanted to ask you about it yeah yeah and and that you know kind of yeah it's it's one of those deals where you're you know, you're looking back in the history books that we all grew up with, you know, it didn't paint quite the picture of of what we're seeing now of Christopher Columbus, but our, our focus is, is pretty much on sticking to, you know, just the charitable works and, and, and us also being adventurers and, and getting out there and seeing what we can do to help people. Yeah, well, really not fair to, you know, take an organization that was founded a couple hundred years after, you know, a certain individual died and they just happened to have the same name. Really not fair to sort of not look at the organization for its own merits and what they do to sort of say, oh, well, because it has this name or it was named after this person, it must follow X, Y, Z. You know, you got to look yeah, exactly. at what what you actually do. Exactly. So. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's that guilty by association type of stigma that you, a lot of people might you know, put on organizations simply because of something that was brought up in the recently, but, you know, back in 1882. Yeah. Um, it, it, it seemed a, a good idea at the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. So, Mike, tell us a little bit about your deal, I guess, uh, which is this uh, crab dinner and auction. Again, it, it just happened here uh, a couple weeks ago at this point when folks are listening to this. But um, tell us a little bit about maybe its history, kind of what the idea was behind starting it, how long it's been around. Yeah, you bet. Well, we started the uh, crab dinner and charity auction 23 years ago. And it had kind of humble beginnings at the time. We had it in our parish gym in Canby there at St. Patrick's Church. And for the first few years, we had, uh, you know, upwards of 75 to 100 people attend. And we'd have maybe, oh, you know, maybe 20 to 30 silent auction items. And then we'd do like five to six oral auction items. It was pretty small, but we wanted to get something started. And at the time, it was just primarily parish members. And mm-hmm. we did that for a few years, and then we decided it was time to kind of think bigger and, and take our charitable fundraising up a notch. And um, one of our members, uh, Brian Heinz, recommended, he said, why don't we do it at the Clackamas County Fairgrounds? It's a, it's, you know, it's a fantastic venue. Uh-huh. It's large enough to house you know, up to four times as many people. Yeah. And this, if we're going to do this, let's 
let's let's go all in. And mm-hmm. so that's what we did. And we moved over to the fairgrounds and you know, the folks at the fairgrounds are so fantastic. They they just go out of their way to help us and and make it so that we can put on a great event. And so we've had it there probably for the last oh I'm gonna guess nineteen years. And it's just we've gone from a hundred people to four hundred people and we've gone from maybe thirty item, auction, silent auction items up to three hundred silent auction items and we do twenty five oral auction items and yeah, and so our money just uh that we raised for charity just exponentially just grew. I mean it it was fantastic and we just kinda of got in our groove. You know, we're dealing with a I'm not I'm not gonna be a male basher here, but we're all guys and so the easier we can make it the better we can do it. <laughs> right. And right. uh and so we we just kinda of stuck in our groove and that's what we've been doing for many years here and we're all I think extremely good at what we do and we're very proud of the event we can do you know put on for everybody in the community and and that's another thing is it grew from a parish only you know event to now it's a community and state while we have people traveling from out of state to come to this every year and it's mm. It's just real exciting to see how many new people we get every year. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, hey, you know, nothing wrong with playing to your strengths, Mike. That's what you got to do, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, the, the team the team that we have working every year putting this on is just, they're stellar. I mean, they every everybody's solid. They do a great job, mm-hmm. and it, it, it makes what I do easy because I don't have to worry so much about everything else. That we've been doing it so long that everybody's, really comfortable with what they're doing and sure. I have a lot of confidence in them. Sure. Sure. Yeah, it, it was a great event. Very, very well run. Uh, you know, obviously the, the generosity that was on display was very moving and, um, just, just wonderful to see. I think, uh, for me, and I mentioned this, uh, before we jumped on the recording as well, I think the most moving part was, um, what you guys called the paddle raising was sort of an impromptu thing in, in the middle where you shared about a local family. Um, baby Amira is their daughter who, at the time, uh, I think 11 months old and had some medical conditions actually in a few years is going to need a heart transplant. And yeah. I, I think it's a local family at St. Patrick's, uh, parish that just was really in need of support and, and just the overwhelming show of generosity there was, was very moving. Yeah. So, and that's, I, I guess that's one of the testaments to our community is they, they can know nothing about an individual or an organization but with just a little bit of information they just pour their hearts into whatever cause you know yeah. is out there and they do every year this group of people these, these 400 people that are in there are, are just it's incredible to see the, the outpouring of support they give to the Knights and the organizations or individuals that were you know sponsoring that year yeah. maybe Mira was I mean, it, it touched so many hearts, mm. the story of this young girl. I mean, it, she's just a child. I mean, she's, she's going to be one years old on the, the 24th of this month. And to think that she has four more years, she, she has to be five years old before she's eligible for, her, for the heart transplant. And to think about four more years of having to endure all the testing and, and, and her parents having to keep her free from, you know, infections and, and just the common cold can set her back. Uh, you know, her heart is running at a capacity of 13%, which is, I mean, for a, for a child that's trying to grow, I mean, it's, it's inconceivable what this, this family's having to go through to keep her healthy. And, mm-hmm. and Ben and Betsy, her parents are just incredible people. And they're, they're, they're just, it's just a, a struggle that they're graciously tackling. You know, there's just a lot of positivity a lot of this, you know, take each day as a, and conquer that day and then conquer the next day and just move forward that way. Yeah. yeah. I just, I just really admire them and I admire the way our community uh, stepped up and, you know, in, in those seven minutes of the paddle raiser, uh, you know, we raised $24,900 for that family. Yeah. Yeah. So help, help, <laughs> defer, help defer some of their costs. Um, for the care that she's requiring. And, and mm-hmm. it's just, I mean, when you, it just gives you goosebumps when you think about it. Yeah. Yeah, so. absolutely. 
Yeah, yeah, that's crazy. Almost $25,000 in seven minutes for this wonderful family. I know uh, for me, and I'm sure for many others, like part of it was just realizing, you know, the serious illness, tragedy, that kind of stuff can happen to anybody, you know, right? Oh, like yeah. I, I think of, I have young kids, you know, I could be in their situation just as the cards had, had turned out a li- little different, you know. Do you have numbers on um, the, the whole event or kind of in general how much uh, this event raises? Well, we're still yes. We're typically we, you know, we gross upwards of seventy thousand dollars that night, and we try to net in the mid fifties. Um, this year, sadly, uh, the price for crab went up. Um, you know, we paid an absorbent amount for crab this year, but it was just due to the weather conditions and mm-hmm. the and the fishermen not being able to get out, so the market just fluctuates due mm-hmm. to that. But yeah, we, we try to keep our costs down we always we have our 501 c3 uh, exemption status that we try to find corporate sponsorship for certain aspects of the auction to defer costs and uh, yeah we do everything we can you know it's 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 a great event it it, it costs money to put it on but we make a, a lot of money to help you know these charitable organizations um you know, survive. I mean, some of them, they just, they go from month to month and they just, yeah, we do whatever it takes. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's awesome. Well, we're almost out of time here, Mike, but I, I didn't want to go too far uh, or, or too, too long without it. mentioning the food real quick. The the food was great. You, you know, you got to mention the crab and how obviously crab, uh, you know, ain't, ain't cheap and is dependent on market factors and, and whatnot. But uh, I think also as part of kind of the appeal of the event itself is, is you know, that it is a crab dinner and and that that's part of it. You, you sort of have to bring your own crackers and, and stuff like that. Because other than that, it's, you know, plastic utensils and stuff like like you know you would expect at a at a, a function such as this um so I, I thought that was fun seeing folks you know bring out their utensils and their ziploc bags and stuff like that and we came yeah. prepared as well but um yeah. where did that uh, aspect come from as far as the crab dinner piece well we always thought that uh you know we've had you know at our church we've always had spaghetti dinners we've had turkey dinners we've had this and that we had never had a, a crab dinner and so when we initially started this uh, this event, we thought crab was, at the time, there wasn't a whole lot of dinners. You know, we hadn't had many, hadn't had any that I know of at the church. So we thought this would be unique, something different. And now it's it's grown to be something everybody, I, I, I think it's one of the more, you know, it's one of the more fun events of the year for our community. Mm-hmm. And it's a great place for folks to come and meet people they sometimes don't see, but once a year at the crab dinner. And yeah. it, it's just, I love the atmosphere of it. It's, it's a, it's just, it's relaxed. It's fun. And, uh, we keep things moving. It's not a, you know, we try not to let it go to, so long that people are just falling asleep, but it's a, it's a lot of fun to do. And it's a lot of fun for the folks there. And I, I like to describe it as an interactive dinner mm-hmm. where you have to crack your own crab. Right. And uh, and I think I think that's just there's something fun about it. I mean, I it's sometimes it's hard to put a finger on it, but it, there's something just it's just electric in that that room at night, and uh, it's fun. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that it's, um, there's just something about community, you know, when, when folks come together, uh, whether we know each other or not, but we, we live in this same place. We have a lot of the same values and a lot of the same heart for, um, the, the different charities that, you know, the families or, or uh, specific causes that this go through. And I think a lot of times when you see that, when you, when you recognize that, that can gloss over a lot of other stuff that might otherwise, you know, divide folks. Yes. Yes. And, 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 and we all love crap. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And I do, I do want to also mention the outpouring of support from the local businesses. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have Mm -hmm. Ken and Lori from the backstop bar and grill. We have uh, Frank Cutsworth from Thriftway. I mean, we have the, you know, the candy liquor store. I mean, we have, we get so much support. And local businesses in Canby, uh, it's just, it's just, it's just unreal how much they give. And mm-hmm. and that, I'd be remiss if I didn't say that a lot of what we do, we couldn't do it without this type of community support. I mean, a bunch of guys trying to 
trying to raise money for charity, you you need a good a support system out there to feed that, and we have that in Canby. Canby is just a phenomenal town that just loves to loves to do this, and, and we're just happy to be a part of it. Awesome. Well, Mike, thank you so much for your time. Thank you and to your uh, your fellow knights, your organization, for all the work that you do supporting worthy causes in our community. Well, Tyler, I appreciate you having us on. And uh, if anybody wants to uh, come to the crab dinner, I just suggest you get your tickets early. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mike. All right, Tyler. Thank you so much for having me on. Welcome to the Canby Now Community Board, where you're in charge. That's right, this is where we share your news with our listeners. Everything from birth announcements, birthdays and obituaries, to local events and accomplishments. If your hashtag can be proud, let us celebrate with you. The Canby Aurora VFW Post 6057 and Auxiliary invites you to join them this Saturday for their annual Iwo Jima flag raising ceremony at the Ackerman Center Gymnasium. All military veterans and their families in particular are encouraged to attend. It's the 75th anniversary of the flag raising at Iwo Jima and the 25th anniversary of the Canby event. Veterans, groups, and service organizations are welcome to participate in the massing of the colors to kick off the event. If interested, contact Martin Lackner at 503-849-8390. The ceremony itself starts at 10 a.m. Refreshments will be provided and we're told there will be also a drawing for a 68 Cadillac. For many, adolescents can feel like a delicate balancing act and some of us handle it better than others. There are neurological changes, new social experiences, and behavioral factors that play a role in adolescent development. Despite the pressures they face, most adolescents make it across the hard wire into adulthood without major problems, but some do not. Why do some adolescents show resilience while others develop significant problems? These questions and many more will be the subjects of a Science, Technology, Engineering and Mathematics, or STEM, talk hosted by Clackamas Community College from 5 to 6 p.m. February 26. That's right, parents. A college professor is going to explain to you why your preteen's brain is so weird, according to science. What could be better? You'll also learn about new insights researchers are finding into the way biological and sociocultural systems impact resilience, as well as promising avenues for understanding adolescent development. The STEM talk will place, take place in the Harmony West Community Room on the Milwaukee campus, 7738 Southeast Harmony Road. Guests are invited to a meet and greet at 430 before the discussion begins. The event is free and open to the public. On the remote Irish island of Inishman in 1934, a word is out that a Hollywood film is being made on the neighboring island of Inishmore. Cripple Billy decides to risk everything to escape his tedious life if only he can get cast in the film and move to Hollywood. So begins The Cripple of Inishman. The comic masterpiece will be presented by Clackamas Community College's theater department this winter. The production was a hit off-Broadway from 1998 and was brought back again on Broadway in 2014, starring Harry Potter himself, Daniel Radcliffe. Written by acclaimed screenwriter and director Martin McDonough, The Cripple of Irishman is a side-splitting dark comedy loaded with unforgettable characters in the great tradition of Irish drama. Directed by James Ekram, The Cripple of Inishman features a dynamic ensemble of CCC students and community members, with scenic and lighting design by Chris Witten, costumes by Gina Piva, and music by guest artist Criff Bear on the Irish fiddle. The Cripple of Inishman runs February 27 to March 8, Thursdays through Saturdays at 7.30 p.m. with Sunday matinees at 2.30 p.m. in the Ninemeyer Osterman Theater at the Oregon City Campus, 19600 Malala Ave. 
there will also be a 10 a.m. matinee on Friday, March 6. An opening night reception will be held February 27 at 6.30 p.m. and includes light refreshments. Tickets are $12 for adults, $10 for seniors 62 and older, and free for students at the door or $5 online. Visit clackamas.edu slash theater or call 503-594-3153 for reservations. Mark your calendars for the upcoming fundraising dinner by Bridge and Cultures next month. It will be held at 6 p.m. March 14 at Zion Mennonite Church in Hubbard. The local nonprofit began 20 years ago by making and handing out bag lunches to neighbors each week in the apartment buildings on Cedar and Locust Street. It's now grown into a diverse organization that has hosted thousands of meals and community events with the goal of building relationships across cultural and economic boundaries. Bridging Cultures invites you to join them in an evening of goodwill, good food, good company, supporting the work of Bridging Cultures to build bridges to neighbors, language, technology, legal status, and leadership in our community. The evening will also include a silent auction and raffle, entertainment, and seriously amazing food. Cost is $40 per person or $160 for a half table. To register, find the link in our story on our website, canbynowpod.com. To get your event announcement or community news on the Canby Now Community Board, email us today at info at canbynowpod.com. Hey, Tyler. So it's February, and you you know what that means. <laughs> you know, there's yeah. a certain feeling in the air. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I yeah. see what you're saying. Yeah. Tax Valentine. time. What? Valentine's. No, I was saying tax day is coming up for when you file. Oh. Uh, but it's it's also Valentine's, you you know. Oh, man. Um, You know, I might need to call my wife real quick. I... I might be in trouble. Okay. Well, if you're looking for some place to have a fun date night, you can always try the Wild Hair Saloon where Camby goes to eat and have fun. They've been in business for over 16 years, serve a fresh, locally sourced menu, and donate over $20,000 to Camby Sports and other causes each year. Check them out just off of Highway 99E next to Space Age in Camby at 1656 Beaver Creek Road in Oregon City, or just go to their website, thewildhairsaloon.net. Hey, hey, honey, so good news, bad news. Uh, good news, we got our taxes filed early this year. The Can Be Now podcast is produced by me, Tyler Clausen. Our content director and star reporter is Tyler Frankie. We also feature the vocal talents of Joy Struby and James Walden. So round of applause to them. The song that you're hearing right now is Can Be by singer-songwriter Olivia Harms, used with her permission. Find more of her work at olivia13.com. The Can Be Now podcast is dedicated to preserving independent local journalism and redefining local news with our fun, fresh, and energetic brand of storytelling. Our sincere thanks to our local sponsors who make this show possible. Please show your appreciation by supporting the small businesses who support us. The Canby Now podcast is a production of Now Hear This Studios, Canby's locally owned full-service audio, video, and media production company. Our mission is to produce the best content in the universe, and we'd love to help you do it. Find us online at nhtstudios.com. I will take a motion to adjourn. I just moved it. I didn't even ask for it, though.